hiking through the black forest with my black lab mango, when out of the corner of my eye, I spotted an old bent pine tree. I just read an article about Ute Indian prayer trees, and I wondered, could this be one of those trees? Well, I went over and looked around and found three more of these extraordinary trees. I almost couldn't believe it. The next week, I invited two friends, Phil and Vern, to join Mango and me in the search of the Ute Indian prayer trees. After a while, we had documented about two dozen of these extraordinary culturally modified trees. But everywhere we went through the Black Forest, you could hear the buzz of chainsaws and wood chippers. You see, this was 2013, and we had just suffered two devastating back-to-back -back wildland fires near where I live in Colorado Springs. And I was afraid that these trees would be mistaken as distressed trees and cut down. So I decided to help spread awareness. I'd publish just a short coffee table book. How hard can that be? Well, we just about had enough photographs for the book, and we're back out, and we just walked past that first tree that I'd noticed when these six words came to me out of the blue. They were, invite the ute to a barbecue. Now, I don't, I don't know where that came from. I, lo I looked down, Mango hadn't said anything. V Vern and Phil didn't say anything, and they didn't hear anything. I looked behind me, nobody was there. But I felt compelled to ask Vern and Phil, hey, what would you guys think if we invited the ute to a barbecue? <laughs> Vern turned and looked at me and says, John, do you know any ute? I had to admit, no, n not a one. But I spent the next week researching the three Ute reservations in Colorado and Utah, and I finally connected with Nathan Strong Elk on the Southern Ute Reservation, who agreed to give me a 15-minute meeting. So the next week, I met with Vern and Phil, and I said, what would you guys think about doing a road trip? Mango had to stay home. but. We found ourselves on the Ute Indian Reservation south of Durango, and Nathan Strong Elk introduced us to this man, Dr. James Jefferson. Dr. Jefferson is an extraordinary man. He holds a PhD in linguistics, speaks five languages, and he spent four years at the Smithsonian helping them interpret their Native American collection when he was just a young man, and while he was there, another Native American taught him a prayer song that he has carried in his heart for the last half century. During our meeting, I showed Dr. Jefferson and Nathan the photos of the trees that we'd found in the Black Forest, and for two hours, they shared their wonderful history and their culture and their stories. At the end of our meeting, I thought this had gone on too long for me not to pose the question. And I said, what would you guys think about coming uh, to a barbecue? <laughs> Both men looked at me, complete strangers, two hours earlier. And Dr. Jefferson finally spoke. And he said, I guess that'd be OK. This photograph of Dr. Jefferson was taken at that first barbecue. We had 15 Ute join us and one lone moose. The next year, we had 30 Ute join us, and that same moose came again. And it was during this time that Dr. Jefferson first asked me to help tell the story what he referred to as prayer trees or spirit trees. You see, he was concerned this part of his culture and his language was being lost. I shared with Dr. Jefferson my concern about not being Native American and so little being written about these trees, how could I possibly know that I'd gotten everything correct? And what he said was that, John, it's not the role of a storyteller to make sure everything's 100% correct. The role of the storyteller is to make sure the story is memorable. So we were planning to go to our third youth prayer tree retreat in Butel, Colorado, and that first tree that you saw on my title slide, it collapsed under the weight of the heavy spring storm. And I asked Dr. Jefferson, I said, how could this tree stand here for over 360 years and then just weeks before we're to visit it, 
it collapsed. And what he said was, I, I don't know. Perhaps it has done what it came here to do. He brought us together for a tree ceremony, and it was a beautiful ceremony. He sang his prayer song to the tree, and he prayed in his Ute language. This was the first time he actually referred to me publicly as a storyteller. And I felt the responsibility and the weight and the honor of being a storyteller. For as you know, the Ute language, like so many Native American languages, had no written alphabet. Their stories have been passed down from one generation to the next for over 10,000 years in the form of stories and ceremonies and songs. The most commonly recognized culturally modified tree or CMT in the world is this tree, the bonsai tree. These were done primarily for relaxation and meditation, started hundreds of years ago with the people of Japan and China. What's different with the Ute prayer trees is that the elders teach us that these trees, which they recognize as a living spiritual entity, would not be modified unless it was done after prayer and with consent of the tree and creator. The most common culturally modified tree in the United States and Canada is the trail marker tree. The one on the left is located at the base of Vail Pass. It points at Gore Creek. These trees point to another trail or a resource or where you can get a drink of water. And if you follow Gore Creek up over Gore Pass, you would end up on the Ute White River Indian Reservation if you were doing this in the 1860s, 1870s. But that reservation disappeared after the Meeker Massacre. All of the Ute people were escorted to one of the three reservations where they remain to this day. The tree on the right is here in El Paso County near where I live. And it, like so many other trail marker trees, has a very distinctive 30 degree angle of inclination, which is also the angle of inclination of a teepee lodge pole. These trees, when you connect to one of the Native American culturally modified trees, are a direct link back to the ancient people, the indigenous people of the US and Canada who modified these trees. These were a people who knew the four names of the wind. They felt the wind upon their face as the breath of creator. These trees will give you a different worldview of the indigenous people of the US and Canada. These were a deeply spiritual people and these trees were an important part of their culture. This photograph I took on Mother's Day, 2015. It was the first Mother's Day without my mother. She had passed away the year before. We were three weeks from going to print on my first book, and I knew this was the cover shot that I wanted because it has two sacred mountains, Pikes Peak, known as Taba, and the Garden of the Gods that were sacred for the Ute. I didn't have the right photograph for that cover. And so I got up early that morning and I knew that Taba had received a fresh blanket of snow. I moped around that morning kind of feeling a little lost what to do. And so I got in the car, invited Mango for a ride, and we drove over the Garden of the Gods. And I got out and I watched as the clouds remained closed in and the sun didn't shine. After several minutes, I gave up and I thought, well, it's just not meant to be. And I walked back to the car and just as I got there, it felt like someone <clears throat> had tapped me on the shoulder. And when I looked back, the clouds were parting. And I ran back to where I was standing and I took one shot, one photo, and that became the cover of my next book. And as soon as I took that one photograph, the clouds closed in again and it remained cloudy the rest of the day. I've had the unique privilege of traveling with Dr. Jefferson throughout much of northern New Mexico and Colorado and eastern Utah. I've been on the ancient lands of his people. I've been on the reservation lands. I've been to the top of Sleeping Ute Mountain. I've listened to the stories of the elders. 
I've been here to the Great Sand Dunes National Park, where we observed over two dozen culturally modified trees known as medicine trees. Dr. Jefferson explains that these trees were modified for navigational purposes, medicinal purposes, storytelling purposes, ceremonial purposes, and for burial purposes, and they're all sacred to his people. We've learned that Native American people across the United States and Canada modified trees for a clock, a calendar, and a compass. We also knew that they transplanted trees planted trees and grafted branches of one tree onto another tree. The tree on the left has a beautiful trail marker tree that has been grafted onto that trunk. It also has a carving on the bark known as an arbor glyph. The trees on the right have been brought together and shaped in such an extraordinary way that they're fused together at the top and the bottom, leaving one slit, one tiny shaft of light that can only shine through that slit between those two trees on only one day of the year, December 21st, the winter solstice. We know, though, that the Ute are not the only Native American people in Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and Utah modify trees. In fact, probably most of the tribes in the U.S. and Canada modify trees. The tree on the left is located about a mile from the Cherokee Trail in Colorado. It may be Cherokee in origin, and we selected that one for the cover of my second book, the tree on the right is an extraordinary tree in southern Colorado, and it was separated when it was a young tree and very pliable, so it's facing straight south at 180 degrees and where the sun sets on June 21st, the summer solstice. We're also told by shamans that the bark extraction is done to extract the cambium, which was used for medicine, and often that's corresponding with on the tree where the wound or the injury that the medicine man or woman was trying to address. We know these trees can be hundreds of years old. Culturally modified trees to be genuine need to be at least 120 years old. This one was found in northern Black Forest and was determined to be 360 years old when it died several years ago. The Native American people, including the Ute, would braid yucca fiber plants that they would make a strong cordage. This cordage was found in a cave in Utah, and it's bound together these, these arrowheads and um, this leather pouch. And this yucca cordage is what was tied around the trees when they were young and pliable. And a wooden stake was driven into the ground, and the tree with the cordage was wrapped around the tree, and it was bent over until the tree straightened seeking the sun. It often leaves its indentations in the bark. We're taught by the elders to use all five of our senses when we explore these trees. The orange color is indicative of age, and the older pond Neurosta pines will also give off this beautiful sweet scent of butterscotch or vanilla. This tree on the left is referred to as a burial tree. It has two 90-degree bends. We're told that that represents how we all come from Mother Earth, we all walk across the earth in life, and at the end of life, we all ascend to Creator. If you go to the front of that tree, you can see that the primary trunk has been girdled, where someone took a sharp edge instrument and cut all the way around the bark, removing the, the bark from that primary trunk, purposely redirecting the natural sun-seeking growth of that tree. What we found is these sacred trees will lead to sacred places. Oftentimes, those sacred places are identified with stone features that can be petroglyphs, teepee rings, or fire pits. In this case, this medicine well was found about an hour west of Denver. And in the majority of cases where you find a, a stone feature and there's trees around, many of those trees have been modified. Two trees, trail market trees, were pointing to that medicine wheel. We've studied that site with botanists and anthropologists and archaeologists, as well as tribal elders. And what we've learned is what we must pass on to others, is to respect both the archaeological integrity of the site, as well as the spiritual sanctity, because that site was sacred to someone. We call this tree the hugging tree. It's here in the Black Forest. And it represents what we here at TED celebrate. 
the spark of the human imagination and idea. Some Native American person a long time before the Declaration of Independence was ever signed had a vision to create this living sculpture. It is a living Native American artifact. It is hundreds of years old and can only be interpreted as an expression of love. These trees deserve to be on our historical and archaeological record for they will inspire discovery, appreciation, and conservation. When you connect with one of these trees in the forest, you cannot but be filled with wonder and hope. But don't wait too long, because these trees and the elders will not be here forever. We need to listen while we have access to our elders. We need to hear their stories, and we need to hear their songs. It is now my honor to introduce to you my mentor from the Southern Ute Tribal Reservation, Dr. James Jefferson. The following song is a Native American prayer song was composed by a Ponca Indian, Harry Buffalo Head, and I learned it in 1986, traveling with him the summer in Washington, D.C. Walk a donny kay down a wheat obey o hey. Walk a donny kay down a wheat obey o hey. Walk a donny kay down a wheat obey o hey. A ton of the Walk a donny kay. He don't know we to obey, oh hey, hey, hey. Don't know we to obey, oh hey, hey. Walk a donny key. Don't know we to obey, oh hey, hey, hey. Walk a donny key. Don't know we to obey, oh hey, hey. He don't know we to obey, oh hey, hey. Walk a donny key, don a wheat obey, oh hey, hey, hey. Thank you. Thank you.